right. Hello, internet. Welcome back to a little bit of a, a ramble, another another notes video. Stuff I've been thinking about and I wanted to just talk about it. Talked about it out loud to myself already. Construction sounds in the background, no script except for five bullet points. And a lot of it's gonna center around immersion, uh, language learning. If you don't know me already, my name is Mark. I'm currently learning Japanese. I'm taking the N3 in December. I've been studying for just over a year or so. I took the N5 in July, I made a video about that, which you can see here. I met up with someone the other day in Seattle and we were talking a bit about Japanese and it got my mind thinking. I had never really like learned about what RTK is, reading the, reading the kanji, and what their methodology was. And I thought that was kind of fascinating. If someone promotes it, there has to be some sort of merit that they see in it. Where's the merit? Because I didn't see it at first. And I'm gonna largely talk about this little epiphany I had, uh, but TLDR, if you find yourself really not being able to do something and you're focusing on getting somewhere, stop focusing on the goal, focus on the habit. I'm a very goal oriented person. And I think that's a good thing because if I break down a goal, that, that's great and get the milestones. But when you have 500 pending reviews, which is now at uh, 399, the goal to get them to zero is so daunting. You don't even start. Uh, and I realized that I'm not even establishing the, the the good habit of doing my reviews on time. It's simply trying to get them to zero, but I don't want that to be my habit. I don't want to spend two hours, you know, every three days. It's not going to help anybody. It's certainly not going to help me learn Japanese. So, yeah, let's get into it. Again, my name is Mark. Uh, that's kind of it for the start. I kind of just want to recap this stuff. Pretty much, if you've seen any of my language learning logs about Japanese, you know I don't, I'm not a big fan of immersion. If you don't know what immersion is, it's effectively immerse yourself, uh, surround yourself completely by your target language, the language you want to learn, and you will acquire it eventually, like a child, because that's what children do. Through the classes I've taken, a lot of this kind of stems from my own fascination in grammar and syntax and semantics, but I don't agree with the immersion as a surface level theory. Yeah, you can go to a country and that's gonna be the fastest way to learn a language perhaps, but it's not because you're just surrounded by it, it's because you are forced to use it and therefore you have to learn it. And oftentimes you can get by learning broken, whatever the language is, and nobody's gonna call you out on it. People will be able to understand you just fine. The first bullet point is that just listening non-actively is pretty met after the first two or so weeks of language learning. I think that there's uh, merit, uh, and then when I say merit throughout this video, I just mean that there's something good about it, right? There's something that I believe to be helpful. I think there's merit to the claim that listening to your target language just passively is a good thing, but only for the first little bit. Because for a while, the language just sounds like bibble bibble. It just sounds like absolute nonsense. You have no idea how to segment words and sound. And you should get yourself used to that. Great, surround yourself with it. You can't just do that forever. If I'm going on a walk, which I've been doing quite a bit recently, and I'm listening to Japanese NHK news or uh, just Japanese music, and my mind wanders, and I'm thinking about work for that day or an issue going on tomorrow, it, I'm probably gonna be thinking in English, language and thought, whole other thing. And I'm not gonna be actively listening. And that doesn't, in my opinion, that doesn't do anything. And in my experience, it hasn't, that hasn't helped. There are songs that I still listen to and I think, wow, I just paid attention for this last 20 seconds and I actually got a few words from it. And I actually could, you know, pick those things apart. But I didn't get that by passively listening to it. It was like, oh, <laughs> I should pay attention. Now, the whole thing with immersion that I don't agree with for the most part is the fact that because kids do it, we should do it too. So much, research about language acquisition, first language acquisition as a child. I don't, you know, if you want to leave a comment debating or arguing, please do. I'm I'm always open to perspectives. Just hear me out for a second. I think immersion is really big in the language learning community. My big thing and bullet number two is that if you just try and rely on immersion, A, it's going to take a while. You know, time is not an important thing. You can take a long time with language. It's going to take a long time with language. But you give up your biggest advantage and that is being an adult. A kid doesn't have the cognitive faculties to, well, you know, the average kid doesn't have the cognitive faculties to pick apart things. When we can see, you know, some math equation, y equals mx plus b or whatever, we can pick apart what that means. So that when we see a more complicated math equation, we can see the connection between uh, these two equations and we can pick them apart. I'm shown some basic integrals and I can then apply it to more complicated integral equations. I don't know why math is my, my choice here, but language can be similar. Now, again, I, I did linguistic stuff and I'm fascinated in general, and I'm sure that correlates with my intrigue for language acquisition and language learning. No one wants to do the boring stuff, right? And so I'm fascinated by Boon Pro teaching you the grammar rules and reading up on the positive cost of positive, passive causative form, the combination of those two forms in Japanese, what it means to have a zero pronoun in a language. Taberu is just the verb to eat, but you can say taberu as in I am eating. <sighs> 
As adults, we should spend time looking actively for things. That is why I, I still do Wani Kani, I still do Boon Pro. The reading the kanji method, and because I touched upon this in the intro video, I'll just talk about this now, is effectively recognize the meanings of the kanji. Don't worry about the sounds or the, the, the way you pronounce. Quick interstitial here. I just want to mention that I don't disagree with the whole visual mnemonic system. I would swear by it myself, as I'll talk about later. I just... I say RTK a little too generally here, but pretty much I just think you should learn the sounds of the kanji, onyomi, kunyomi, all that, as well as how they're pronounced in different vocab words while you learn them. I apologize for my overgeneralization here, which I don't get because you're learning a language. You're not learning to recognize things arbitrarily. And I got that with kanji pretty early on. I was like, oh shoot, I'm just memorizing symbols and the sounds associated with them, I'm not learning how to use them within context. I can learn any number of words, but if I don't have the context to use them in, again, what's the point? There's that surface level thing of memorizing what it means isn't really all that different from just memorizing a bunch of words arbitrarily because you can't put them in context. But then when you get that context, which is what Boon Pro is for me, the Boon Pro grammar points are giving you context, new verb forms. I just finished all the N4 grammar points. It's done four a day. My reviews are at like 100 145 a day. This is where the whole habit thing came about. So honestly, I have like, but that's not the point of this video. If you learn words in isolation, it's not great help. So you need context. And over time, as I keep seeing sudu after different words, like benkyo sudu, benkyo is studying. And then you 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 make it into a verb, to study, to be doing studying. And then you can add on to it with te iru. So benkyo shi te iru. Uh, you know, however that those things change, you get the context of that word and you can adapt that rule to the general scheme of things. You know, in contrast with this screenshot from Refold here, which by the way, I think is a great resource, but just to combat it a little bit, while I totally disagree with understanding a language speaking is then a piece of cake, uh, we can see at the bottom, it says that, you know, you can't just make language an equation and the result sounds weird if you one-to-one -one convert it, and it does. And that's why Google Translate, for example, doesn't do one-to-one -one translation. It translates based on statistical models and different things like that. The example from English to Japanese is a good one, but while there might be no grammar guide in the world that can explain that, these nuances can be explained within the realm of linguistics. You don't need to study linguistics, but tackling grammar and understanding the patterns can help us consciously think about them to bolster what Refold here references as a language instinct. It bolsters that instinct. I don't think it takes away from it. Immersion, this is where immersion, in my opinion, plays in, because as you're watching a TV show, listening to music, listening to a podcast actively, if you watch anime, I just please watch it actively. Also anime and manga, I think I've learned is a little dangerous because they use a lot of slang, but I still watch anime, whatever. Pay attention and see if you can hear things. Uh, see if you can hear the te form of a verb or words you simply have heard. I'm sure there are so many people out there who just watch, you know, subtitled anime and can probably say a few Japanese expressions because it's been drilled in so many times, but maybe not verb endings. I mean, when I first started thinking about Japanese and I heard watashi wa, I thought the wa was I, the pronoun, but it's watashi. And then as you go into it, if you just go with immersion and you know, you hear boku, watashi, ore, all different words that mean I pretty much, you can get a good understanding of what situations in which to use those pronouns. Kids pick that up in a different manner. We might just see three versions of the word I and stop thinking about it. And that's the thing, we might just stop thinking about it. But if you do a quick Google search, you might learn about honorifics and how ore, boku, and watashi are all different levels of uh, professionalism. You're not gonna go up to, you know, the emperor or whatever and go, boku wa. You just, it's just inappropriate. And that's an intrinsic rule that kids learn over time through social norms. And if you go live in Japan, I'm sure you'd pick that up as well. Maybe if someone gives you a nasty look uh, for saying some I that you read in a bunch of manga only to learn that they only really do that in manga. I'm going so off the rails. That's just what these videos are. I apologize. Now I can't, <laughs> the fourth bullet point, I can't prove this. I can't show that any of my methodologies work until, I don't know if I can even prove it then, until I pass the N3 in December. Pass or fail, I'm gonna continue with N3. I'm not gonna bother with N2 or N1. The JLPT exams are weird, in my opinion, because they don't test speaking and they don't test writing. I can't write kanji to save my life. You can recognize it really well, but it's just like how you can recognize someone's face really clearly, but then when you get have to go and draw it, you're like, what are the proportions of eyes to nose to mouth again? Where are the, are the ears hot? Like that kind of thing. One of the things that has helped 
immensely with listening because it's one of the easiest things you can do. I'm going for a walk, oh snap, bike into CrossFit, oh snap, I can listen to a podcast. You can actively listen for te form, past tense, the things you're learning in Boom Pro. When I'm reading this light novel, Toradora right now, I'm like a page a day. I don't understand most of it. I'm not gonna pretend like I understand most of it, but there are times when I'll see something and think, oh, that's Teoku? Uh, to, to make in advance, I think. Like, I just, you know, I had that Boom Pro review come up earlier. Boom Pro has its flaws. You know, you get the English version of something and you think, ooh, how do you say just? Okay, it's dake. Great, you, you check off a box. But if you don't read the whole sentence on Boom Pro, then it's it's just a memorization game. Again, immersion plays in there because you, you gotta put things into context, right? Kanji, the meaning of kanji are given context by the words that they are used in and the words they make up. And those words are given context by grammar. And the grammar is given context by actually using Japanese. I had this realization uh, two or so months ago and I was like, why am I learning Japanese? And and not living Japanese. I turned my phone to Japanese a while ago, that was just a default thing I did. But why am I not changing all of the media I consume into Japanese? I wanna speak Japanese, I might as well enjoy Japanese media. I wanna to get to a point, and this is largely something I'm going to amp up once the N3 exam is over. Start journaling in, in Japanese pretty seriously. Uh, start turning more things into Japanese. Getting myself to speak more. Also another thing I've seen on things like Refold is don't speak. What? Anyway. <laughs> Coming back to RTK for a second, I've started to give merit to this as I'm going through these hundreds of vocab reviews because you go through words and you're like, oh shoot, I don't remember this. Next, I don't remember this. Next. I had this method and I, I did a lot of memory stuff in high school and I've continued those uh, techniques through the day. I read a book about half a year ago called Moonwalking with Einstein that goes over all of this. But things like memory mnemonics, uh, if you have to memorize a shopping list, oh, there's broccoli and ground beef and cheese. Well, you might think about you walk in the door to your apartment and oh my God, there's a huge tree growing there, but it's a huge broccoli tree. And what's chewing on the broccoli cheese? A gigantic cow. And you look at the cow and oh my God, it's made of cheese. Well, there's your shopping list, broccoli, cow, cheese. And kanji, to memorize it, and this is only Wani Kani does, which is why I kind of paid for Wani Kani and went for it, is they also encourage mnemonics. And what I came to do was the meaning of kanji would be associated with an image, and then the sound, the pronunciation of the kanji becomes associated with any verbiage going on in that image. And when you're doing 40 vocab words a day and doing reviews, that gets a little taxing, both on the amount you have to memorize, the mental exertion that takes, and the time that it takes to do that. The thing is, these mnemonics are great. Long story short, you create a mnemonic, you see the thing and that crazy image comes to mind and you think about what that image represents and then eventually the mnemonic falls out. There are so many instances where, you know, I'll see rain now, I don't even remember what my mnemonic for rain was at the beginning. It's just ame and I just remember rain when I see it. But RTK may have been onto something in the sense that you memorize all the images the meanings, and then you go for the readings. I don't think you should do this, but when it comes to memorizing kanji, I think you should pay attention to the sound. And when my vocab reviews come up, I'm not gonna check off that I know it if I only remember the meaning and not the sound. But I have found that going through reviews, building up the recognition is good because as you get the recognition, you can get the meaning. And if you can get the meaning, you can then associate the meaning with the sound of the word. This is purely experimental. That's the only reason I sat down to like film this video. I started these bullet points like two days ago, but then I was like, I kind of want to think out loud about this. So again, let me know what you think if you want to argue. So going through my vocab reviews, I'm going to try and memorize the sounds, of course. Think about the meaning and then what the sounds refer to because creating a mnemonic where the the nouns of the mnemonic are the meaning and the sound the verbiage if you will is the sound it's kind of tough it's mentally taxing i don't know if i'm fully capable of doing that yet and when you have to cram 640 words in about two weeks uh it, it's not feasible to create this many mnemonics i don't know if i can do that i'm definitely not at that level yet so <laughs> That's just what I want to mention, and that's what I'm going to be trying. So going through vocab reviews quickly, like um, I'm optimizing for speed right now so that I can build up that recognition. I don't check it off that I know it. I just remember the sound in the short-term memory. And then and then we keep going, and then we go from there. And then I make the sound a mnemonic, so when I see the two kanji, I remember what it means. I'm going to still use mnemonics and whatever, but this whole noun verbiage thing is kind of... It's too much. Yeah, when you cram hundreds of vocab words and grammar points, you find the faults of memory and the things that work for you. you know, exposing recognition and building sound off of that, that does have its weak points. I don't think it's optimal because what I learned quickly was that when I was reading kanji, you start to rely on the meaning, then you can think of the sound. 
but you might not be able to recognize that word in hiragana, which is what happens on the JLPT exams. Is you'll, you'll get words that you might know the kanji for, or in my case, when I took the N5, pseudo N5, I saw kanji or hiragana words and I was like, I should know exactly what that is. Like it sounds so familiar, but I just can't think of the kanji with the sound. This whole meaning to sound kind of exacerbates or makes that problem worse in my opinion, but hey, it's something to try, right? And at the end of the day, you just have to find what works for you and not some magical method that works for someone else. If there's a method out there that's popular, it's got a lot of good presence behind it. There's something there because someone said, this worked for me. And if it worked for them, there's probably something there that will work for you. And maybe it's just not gonna be the same exact thing. The last thing is just relating to this quote I have up here. Uh, but, but, but. Don't focus on zero, focus on a routine. Don't orient around a goal, orient around a habit. In my efforts to be a little less goal oriented, uh, you know, not focusing on getting the reviews to zero. At the end of the day, if I can memorize grammar points and fit them into context and memorize vocab and fit them into grammar points, which then have their own context. If I can practice reading those sentences that show up on Boom Pro grammar reviews, if I can sit there on this app that I have and go through quizzes of verb endings, then as I start to produce speech, I can actually do it. I can actually practice and maybe visualize what things are but I have to build the routine to get there. I shouldn't be focusing on zero. Zero is not the point. Having an optimal Japanese proficiency is not the point. I'm not gonna know all the N3 vocab by the time I take the N3. I'm definitely not gonna know all the N3 grammar by the time I take the N3, but I'm going to have seen it and hopefully I'll have enough to get by because then I can focus on it. Then I can actively embrace an immersion because I wanna learn more languages and it's not feasible to do this for the rest of my life. I wanna, you know, get off of reviews in a couple years and learn Japanese by doing Japanese. Read a book because it's in Japanese and that's my practice. Watch TV in Japanese and that's my practice. That's my living in Japanese. That's it. That's where I think immersion is so key. I don't think you should necessarily start there. You should read and watch media as soon as possible. I, I agree with that. But if you're an adult and by adult, I mean anywhere past the age of 13, pay attention to grammar. Maybe not explicitly grammar, but the rules. The rules are patterns and we can understand patterns. Cognitively, objectively, patterns are how we live. We live by patterns. So just give it a shot. If you disagree with me, if it doesn't work for you, whatever, let me know. I'm curious to hear other people's experiences. I'm not trying to preach and say, this is the ultimate way. Immersion, bad, grammar, good. I just know what I've gained out of it. I've gained a lot out of it and I'm still gaining from it. And I think it's important. That is all I wanna say. It's just open your mind to this other thing that isn't immersion, that actually takes a lot of active effort to memorize, mostly. I'm not saying reading and watching TV is an active effort or doesn't take work. That is it. That's my food for thought today. That's my thing about immersion, my thing about focusing on a routine. Thanks for watching. Uh, Seattle Vlog Part 2 should be out by now. So yeah, check out that vlog. I don't know if you're curious more about me. I'll have another notes video out at some point and I'll probably release another one of these at some point because when you sprint something, even if I fail in three, I will have gotten very far regardless. When you sprint something and you sprint a distance, it, you tend to just be like, oh, wow. I came from all the way back there. Leave your thoughts and comments in the comments below. It's weird if I don't end with this, but thanks for watching. Have a good one. And as always, don't forget to stay awesome. I'll see you in the next one.